My name is uh, Mark Brown. I do a, a number of presentations here at RISE, primarily with travel with my wife, and also some history and also um, some sports. Um, Baseball has always been a passion of mine, and I've been really, really fortunate to cover the game as a sports writer for a number of years. And during the course of our presentation, I will show you or will display how a game is, is covered, what we do. And I have some things to display over here, some of the memorabilia I've collected over the years in covering games. This is um, from the, 19, uh, the 2011 All-Star game that was played here. And also, we were fortunate to have tickets for the very last season at Old Yankee Stadium in New York before it was torn down. So the ticket and the, and the memorabilia is over there. Um, I must admit to having a, a bobblehead collection that that's close to 100, I guess. So, <laughs> so, so a couple of my favorite friends here. Uh, we mentioned if anyone was from Cincinnati, Joe Nuxall, who was the youngest player ever in the big leagues during World War II at age 15. Tommy Lasorda from the Dodgers when he pitched for the Brooklyn Dodgers. There's a little B on his hat. And a contemporary player. Um, Archie Bradley from the Arizona Diamondbacks. But um, the, despite the rise of, of, of professional baseball uh, and professional football and basketball uh, in America over the last half a century or so, baseball has always remained within the American imagination. A pastime, um, we pass it on from generation to generation. We have stories, um, we have no people who have played. And part of the language of baseball has, has find its way into the American lexicon. Um, there have been some um, memorable quotes from the games. Walt Whitman, for example, as early as the middle of the American Civil War, it indicated that baseball is America's game. And although the origins of the game are pretty much unknown, we're going to get into that a little bit, um, it did develop primarily in the United States um, in the 1840s and flourished uh, by the time of the 1876 formation of the National League. The American League was formed in 1901. We'll go, uh, and so the, the interest, the passion, th there's a great sense of, when, you, when we say baseball, we say, and, and it's usually in the same vocabulary with apple pie and, 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 and uh, our, our old hometowns. But it, when people say, well, this is as American as, as, as apple pie, then baseball uh, clearly cap captures the American imagination from its early origins on the left uh, to some of the great icons on the right, Ted Williams. Uh, baseball has continued to capture um, our imagination. Um, the image on the left is, is revealing for it shows one of the origins of the game. Um, the, this particular photograph here, uh, is, is, it's an unknown destination, but we can see the uniforms of the 1870s and 80s and how just a baseball diamond was carved out of, out of a pasture, a field, and people had gathered everywhere um, because of the interest of the game. And then later on, icons like Babe Ruth had developed. By mid-century, Stan Musial on the left, Hank Aaron on the right began to capture the American imagination as well. And, and we get into the contemporary times with Mike Trout of the Angels, Bryce Harper of the Phillies, two of the more, more contemporary um, figures in the game today. The origins of the game is essentially unknown. It goes back to 12th and 13th century Europe, where there, there's a description of um, individuals, both children and adults, trying to bat a round object with a stick. Um, most theorists um, explain the game originated from England, in either rounders or in cricket. But the game really didn't take hold until the, until the 1840s. Now, we all love a good novel. We love to read. We love to have a good novel. This man is in the origin of the novel. Um, Abner Doubleday, we all know the story about um, Doubleday and how he invented the game of baseball. Uh, it's been debunked. It's a total myth. I reject the myth. I call it strictly, it's a novel. A novel still to be written. Doubleday, th there was the Mills Commission in early 
um, 20th century, which credited Doubleday with creating the game in 1839 in Cooperstown, New York. Sat down, devised all the rules, and was given, and actually named the game baseball. The first time that we actually see the word baseball written is in a children's book in 1744 in England. The term baseball is used for the first time. Double, Double Day in 1839 was at West Point, New York and had a very distinguished career in the military, especially during the Civil War. Um, he had absolutely nothing to do with the origin of the game. When he died in 1893, the New York Times obituary had not mentioned anything about baseball. He was, he was studious, sedentary, had absolutely no athletic interest, and, ha and had absolutely no involvement in the game. Yet the, the novel the novel persists that, that he actually sat down one day and created the game. Um, we know that that did not happen. But unfortunately, this novel does not end very well for, for Doubleday. He dies in 1893, and from the, he was instrumental in the Battle of Gettysburg during the war. And from the time of the battle ended, and he had a conflict with the Union commander, General Meade, in terms of military strategy, uh, in, in terms uh, relative to that particular conflict. And he spent the rest of his life defending his position and, and the positions that he took in that battle had absolutely nothing at all to do with the game. And when the Times, the New York Times had his obituary in, 1990, in 1893, there was absolutely no mention at all of the word of baseball. So the image on the right, just take that bat and ball out of his hand and put it back on the battlefield because he had absolutely nothing to do with the game. One of the early um, innovators of the game is this man. This is Daniel Doc Adams, who was actually a physician in New York in the 1840s. And he became involved in the early origins of the game in the 1830s and 1840s in New York. One of the things that Adams had suggested as, as the rules began to, uh, as players began to become engaged in the game and rules were, were developed and created, he saw that between second base and third base that there was a great deal of distance and balls were being hit into that area. So he devised a, a way to stop that by putting a fourth infielder in, 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 a fourth fielder in the infield. And Adams is, is credited with creating the position of shortstop that we know today. And also codified some of the rules, particularly 27 meters between bases or 90 feet. So Adams is influential in the development of the game in two reasons. Number one, he creates the position of the shortstop. And number two, he determines the, the, the length of the bases at 27 meters in a diamond shape. And that's essentially the origin of the game. In the 1840s, the game begins to develop. The, the New York Knickerbockers be, have the first game um, among themselves in, in, a, in a club, in a club um, environment. The, these guys really don't look like the, uh, the very first baseball team, but they are. This is the New York Knickerbockers. Had the first game in June of 1846 in Elysian Park in New Jersey, in Hoboken. And this man also was credited with creating some of the rules of the game, Alexander Cartwright, who later became a fireman. He is in the middle of the image down here. Um, but he, had, he was interested in the early development and organization of the game, and so has a footnote uh, in the history. But the Knickerbockers um, in New York were the first club to actually begin to organize. And by 1857, there were 40 clubs in the New York area that were playing the game. The game really took off from a national perspective during the American Civil War. E and even though the game, is, its origin was essentially confined to the New York area, as a result of downtime, and you can see on the right that, well, I'm sorry, you can see on the right that these are not rifles, but they're baseball bats. And some have baseball bats in their hands as well. So during, in camp during downtime, baseball was played and soldiers from other parts of the country became introduced to the game. And as a result, it became nationalized. When some of the Union soldiers were captured here, whoops, I'm sorry, were captured here, in this image, in Confederate camps, the game was in introduced to those in the South, and as a result of the war, it became nationalized. Uh, later on, World War I, 
images of baseball, and in the image on the right are American soldiers showing baseball to British soldiers during World War II. Uh, what's interesting, see the glove here. Quite a difference to what we use now, but uh, and, and, and the bat. So th there are clear, clear uh, stories and images uh, of, of those in the military that actually played the game. My dad was in World War II and actually played with um, a pitcher from the Philadelphia Phillies on his club team, um, and it signed the baseball uh, that we still have in, in the family possession. So, so the game begins to become nationalized in the mid-1860s. And by 1869, the image on the right shows the first professional team. This is Cincinnati. The first, prof the first team to play for pay, Cincinnati Red Stockings in 1869, and the image on the left, or one of the early images um, of the first professional team in the, in the mid-19th <clears throat> mid century. So if the first professional team is founded in 1869, six years later, the image on the right establishes the National League. So a league is formed for the, for the purpose of organizing the game of baseball. And you can see the image on the right shows some of the uh, cities of origin. The one that interests me is Providence, Rhode Island had a franchise, but in 1883 moved and became the Philadelphia <coughs> Phillies, which is my hometown. And, in 19, and the image on the left, 1901, the American League is founded with, with franchises in New York, Washington, Cleveland, Detroit, St. Louis. So by the early 20th century, both the American and the National Leagues are formed, and we begin to see the, the permanency uh, of the game. These are some of the images of the teams from the late 19th century, team on the right from 1882. And we had mentioned the, the franchise in Providence, Rhode Island that moved to Philadelphia in 1883 became the Philadelphia Phillies. And the Phillies are the, lo uh, the longest standing nickname of any team that remains in the game. These are some of the figures of the late 19th century. <coughs> Cap Anson played for Chicago, a terrible racist. And we, we can get into that in a second. The figure on the right was one of the early power hitters of the game, Ed Delahaney, from uh, uh, primarily with the Philadelphia Phillies. Um, and he, ha he holds the fourth highest batting average in the history of the game. Um, he, he met a, a, a rather interesting death. In 1903, he's on a train going through uh, upstate New York, and apparently he had too much to drink, and the conductor threw him off the train, and he kind of waddled, waddled and stumbled, and, and two weeks later, they found his body at the bottom of Niagara Falls. So, the, so that's a guy... Who, <laughs> but uh, he was regarded as one of the great early power hitters of the game. Um, and his home run, and I have some stats on here, uh, on him in a second. Um, for the late 19th century, his figures were kind of amazing. He had 101 homers, 1,464 RBIs, 522 doubles, 185 triples, and 455 stolen bases in his 13 years in the majors. He batted 346, and that's the fourth highest average in the history of the game. So this guy was really, really productive. With the development of the game is the development of equipment, and we can see the difference from the baseball glove in the upper left to, to the glove that we have now. Um, the bats here had the thick barrel, um, and I'm, I'm going to mention something about this a little bit later on. And the catcher's mask, um, the, the equipment for the catchers have, has always been called the tools of ignorance. And this is an image from the early 20th, 20th century. So after the formation of both leagues, um, the American League by 1901, and the National League in 1876, they begin to play together or to merge for a championship. And so the first World Series is conducted in 1903 between Pittsburgh and the Boston Pilgrims before the Red Sox. And uh, Boston wins the fir first World Series in 1903. Uh, it's interesting, especially the image on the left, how fans could could actually <coughs> congregate and watch the game on the field here. And also, uh, and the, for me, the early images of the game are, are, are striking and quite interesting when you consider the fashions as well. And so, the, so uh, th there's a social commentary as, as well as, as a historic one as well. 
Some of the early icons of the game on the left, Cy Young, 511 wins in a career. No one will ever t touch that. In the middle image, Christy Mathewson from the New York Giants and the notorious and aggressive Ty Cobb um, on the right. Another early image of, of the game, Connie Mack, who managed the Philadelphia Athletics for 50 years. No one has ever done that, and probably no one will ever do that again in the history of the game. Um, and talking on the image on the left, talking to Jimmy Fox, one of the great home run hitters of Ruth's uh, team. There was a story in Sports Illustrated uh, a couple of years ago that said that Cotty Mack's 1929 Athletics probably was the best team in the history of the game, depending on, on, on statistics, what they did, and how they demolished the competition. But Mack had some great teams in, in 1910, 1915, in that particular area and also in the, in the late 20s and early 30s. One of the problems that baseball faced in the late 19th century was wooden facilities. Most of the ballparks that were created, and we talked about, and we saw some of the franchises early, early on, were made of wood and susceptible to early destruction and fire. By the early 20th century, the stadiums that we see here began to be built of brick and concrete to address the fire issue. And uh, the stadiums developed essentially um, from third base to first base, and then were actually built on, which is why we have so many different shapes and configurations, that the, the, the only stationary element of the game is 90 feet between each of the bases. But you, but you can see here that the distance in, in Old Forbes Field down the right field line, down the left field line, was, dis, was, was different um, than the distance in Ebbets Field or the distance in Sportsman's Park or because these stadiums developed piecemeal and the only stationary um, element of the game was the 90 feet. But some of these, uh, some of these stadiums developed their own per personalities, their own characteristics. Um, I was not fortunate to see a game at Ebbets Field, but I was fortunate to see a game here in Shy Park. This, uh, when this was built in 1909, it had the Boak Tower, which was an architectural um, wonder. You figure, um, the commentary indicated why would, would something of, of architectural splendor find itself into a baseball stadium? Uh, because Benjamin Scheib, who was the owner of the Philadelphia Athletics at the, at the turn of the century, um, had an art feel and wanted to do that. Scoreboard on the right is an old is an image from Yankee Stadium. And when we first came in, we talked about, it, um, particularly in Wrigley Field, where you could, uh, where the ballpark is right in the middle of the city, and on the top of the rooftops, you can actually look into the stadium. That was definitely the case here. This is, uh, if we go back to this image, this is uh, the one in Philadelphia. So this is 20th Street, and along here is Lehigh Avenue, and behind it is 20th Street. And that's what 20th Street looked like. This is the right field fence right here, left field. And this is, this is an image from the 1920s uh, what, when, when we had talked about Connie Mack and as athletics were dominating uh, the American League. You could actually, even mingling around outside, but you can see here, just, and you're able to look right into the ballpark. Um, in, I think in, in, in Chicago, you're able to do that, but this is, I think this is a really good example. And even people looking out of their windows here to get some kind of view or vision of the stadium. Um, this ballpark was torn down in 1976 and, um, Yes, in 1976, because Veterans Stadium came in in 1971. But I remember as a kid crawling under, the stadium had not been torn down yet. And, and I actually picked up a seat from a box. It was a red seat with a number two on it. And I kept it in my, in my, in my house. And of course, um, my mother threw it out. I mean, it's, it would have been a great souvenir of the game. Um, an old seat from, from, and if you go to the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, there were seats from ballparks long ago, Ebbets Field, the Polo Grounds, and other stadiums. I had one from Shy Park, but uh, and also it reminds me of the time um, for, for those who've been to Cooperstown, 
of the Baseball Hall of Fame there. There's a storefront right across from the museum that has a big sign. We have the baseball cards your mother threw out. <laughs> and I'm sure they have mine as well. And, and then and the, and the two oldest ballparks that still remain, Wrigley Field in Chicago, and we talked about it was the site for the Federal League in the early, in the early 1910s. And this is how Wrigley Field looks today, and the image on the right is Fenway Park, how that looks today too. Fenway Park was 1912, and is the oldest stadium still in existence uh, in the major leagues, but it is not the oldest ballpark in existence in America, and, and we'll show that in a second. There have been gr some great images of the game, some great moments. Um, the, the Willie Mays catch on the 1954 World Series. Um, the image on the left is what is believed to be Babe Ruth pointing to the bleachers in Wrigley Field, and then he said, oh, but that's where it's going, and on the very next pitch, he hit it right into the bleachers. Um, this is... Uh, this is the only image that remains for, from that particular uh, day, and then um, it became one of the iconic moments in the history of the game when Ruth stands at home plate, points to the bleachers in Wrigley, and says it's going out on the next pitch. Um, first walk-off home run of World Series history, Bill Mazeroski of the Pittsburgh Pirates in 1960. Don Larson's perfect game in the 1956 World Series remains one of the iconic moments in the history of the game. Um, this is another great iconic image of the game, Carlton Fisk in the 1975 World Series, wishing that his ball was going to stay fair, and it did, and he beat, beat the Reds in a World Series game in 1975. And then some of the great um, individuals, Nolan Ryan, and if you take a look at his Hall of Fame plaque, some of the things that he accomplished. Um, Truly amazing in the history of the game, um, unparalleled. He pitched in the majors for 24 years, 5,700 strikeouts, seven no-hitters, and 12 one-hitters. Um, and just a, a tremendous, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the great players uh, really in the history of the game. Sadie Koufax, um, starting with Brooklyn and then ending in Los Angeles, um, was extremely instrumental in the Dodgers. Uh, run of championships in the 1960s. And if you were in New York in the 1950s, was it Mays or Mantle? So you decide for yourself. Uh, there, were so many there were so many discussions, um, I wouldn't say arguments, but uh, observations and uh, insights to whether Mays or Mantle was the better player. There was also the development of the Negro Leagues um, when um, African Americans were uh, this, uh, were denied. Josh Gibson, the ca great catcher, this is one guy I wish I could have seen play, apparently had tremendous home run power and was a great, great team leader. Uh, Pittsburgh Crawfords were one of the iconic teams of the Negro League. And if those of us, uh, if anyone saw the film Green Book, I'm sure that the Green Book was right in their, right in their bus. Um, because of the segregated accommodations uh, throughout America in the 1920s and 30s. Buck O'Neill and the Kansas City Monarchs. O'Neill became a great, um, he was first baseman, he, he became a, a great um, um, chronicle of the Negro Leagues after he retired, and it was instrumental in the development of the Negro League Hall of Fame in Kansas City, where he played for many years. And some of the great players, uh, uh, in the Negro League, Oscar Charleston and Cool Bapa Bell. There was a story about um, Bell. He was so fast that um, he, he would be able to get into bed before the light was off. Was... But then after World War II, this happens, and there were four events in America um, in the 1930s and 40s that begin to change the racial attitudes. Uh, the first is uh, Marion Anderson, which he sings um, at the Lincoln Memorial. Jackie Robinson coming into the Brooklyn lineup. Um, the Brown versus Board of Education case and President Truman's decision to, to desegregate the Army, uh, the U.S. military in the 1940s were four of the important events in America that helped to transform social attitudes. And this is one of them. Um, the image on the right is, uh, I think, really important. 
Um, that's, that's Jackie Robinson with Pee Wee Reese. Reese was uh, essentially a Southerner from Louisville, Kentucky, but kept Robinson under his wing and, uh, and they became great friends afterwards. And Reese was probably one of the greatest supporters of Robinson and his uh, insert and, and his insert into the in, into the Brooklyn uh, lineup. Some images of his playing day: um, a um, fierce, fierce uh, competitor, um, and, and, and just a very, very good baseball player. This is the image um, that was that was commissioned in 2017 outside of Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles. Robinson broke in, into the Brooklyn lineup on April the 15th, 1947. And in, in 2017, to commemorate the, the 70th anniversary of his insertion into the lineup, there was a sculpture that was commissioned that's outside Dodger Stadium. And that's um, the image there along with the plaque. The image on the left here is a, is a photograph that is in Dodger Stadium. Um, for those who um, I've been really fortunate to able to cover games in Dodger Stadium. And from the main concourse, there's a stairway that leads down to the clubhouse. And when you first, when you go down the flight of, when you open the door to go down the flight of stairs, this is the image that you see right here. Um, it's very powerful and, and very telling. And it's in, in a perfect spot for people to recognize uh, Jackie Robinson's achievement in the game. Um, the image on the lower left, Branch Rickey, who, who signed Robinson and was also there for his Hall of Fame induction uh, with, his, with uh, Rachel Robinson, his wife, who's, who's still alive in, in, in her, into her 90s as well. But Br uh, Branch Rickey was one of, the, um, uh, one of the more instrumental figures in, in, in the social consciousness of the game. And I think these two images portray that. Robinson's number 42 has been retired, and no one in the game of baseball will wear 42 again. And every year on April the 15th, every team, every player on every team wears number 42 uh, in honor of his achievement and his um, social status. However, Robinson was not the first African American in the game. This is Moses Fleetwood Walker. He was a catcher in 1884 for Providence only played one year, but he was clearly aware of his background and also faced a great deal of racial discrimination um, during the course of his playing day. He later retired as a businessman and, and um, innovator. Uh, he had developed a number of patents regarding military operations. But, Fleet, but uh, Moses Walker was actually the first African-American in the game prior to Jackie Robinson. Baseball has been um, has 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 had an important part in, in the arts in America, in literature, in music, in film. These are paintings by the artist Leroy Neiman, who has done a number of sports paintings. The image of Sandy Koufax on the left, Willie Mays on the right. So, if there was a importance in in painting, it was also importance in, in literature. This is Ernest Thayer, who, who, <clears throat> who wrote the poem Casey at the Bat in 1888. Thayer was um, a Harvard student, uh, essentially a humorist, became friends with William Randolph Hearst, the publisher, and, <clears throat> and was able to secure a job through Hearst's newspaper in San Francisco. It actually covered baseball. But in 1888, he sat down and wrote the poem it's fairly lengthy, we're all familiar with it, but it became one of the more iconic poems. Uh, when, we, when we think of poets in America, we'll think of Carl Sandburg and Robert Frost, and we think of them, but not particularly what they wrote. In this particular mo poem, we know what was written, but we don't know the author, or the author doesn't escape us. But this is Ernest Thayer, who, whose Casey the Bat uh, became one of the great um, um, elements of American literature uh, in the late 19th century. So if, if Thayer immortalized baseball with Casey at the bat, then this became an iconic um, structure, um, music uh, in the early 20th century. 
It's an interesting uh, story. Um, the words were by Jack Norworth and the music by Albert Van Tinsler, Tin Pan Alley artist. And the story goes that Norworth was on, a, on an elevated train in New York in 1908 and saw a sign that said, game today. So he, so he decides that, well, maybe I'll get together with my friend who's the composer and we'll get together. And how about a, a, a game about baseball? The image on the right here kind of wonder how this person gets into, in, in, into the promotion marquee. So North sits down one day and he creates this character. Whoops. He creates this, this fictional character here, Katie Casey, and has two verses or two, stand, two verses in a stanza. And he starts out by saying that Katie Casey was baseball mad. She had the fever, had it bad and entertains a, a date, and the date comes over and says that, let's go to the show. And, K and Katie says, I'm not going to the show, you can take me out to the ball game, take me out with the crowd, and buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. And so that's how it started. And now, and, and the, uh, on the left we meet Edward Meeker, who, re who recorded the first Take Me Out to the Ball Game in 1908 and sang it about 10,000 times. It's interesting because Norworth and Van Tinsler never saw a baseball game, but wrote about it. And Norworth saw, his, so Norworth saw his first game 32 years after he, he penned the words, and Van Tinsler saw his first game 20 years after he wrote the music. If you go out to Chase Field, this is the Bobby Freeman who will at the stadium console, we'll, we'll, we'll crank it out at the middle of the seventh inning. And sometimes if the game goes into the 14th inning, seven innings later, he'll play it again. But, um, and, I, and, and I have, um, one time I, I recorded him on my, so, so, if I, so I wanted um, to have a particular notion of the game, you can always play it back. But um, when you get to any particular ballpark, it can be a minor league, um, major League. Uh, it's interesting though t to note that that even though the song was written in 1908 it was not played for the first time until 1934 it was a high school game in Los Angeles and later in the 1934 World Series it was actually played so even though this was written in 1908 it still took a couple of decades uh, to come in, in into the American imagination and the Dodgers had their own symphony band too. We talk about music of the game. Um, this was part of the um, uh, part of the romanticism of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Uh, they had their own uh, our bums. Um, Jackie Robinson uh, was the subject of. Uh, uh, we've heard this many times uh, by uh, Buddy Johnson. And then in literature, um, baseball has become lion eyes in literature. Um, Roger Kahn, with a great description of the Brooklyn Dodgers in the 1950s, has become one of the standards uh, of nonfiction. And then f and from the standpoint of novels, baseball has been part of American literature. Uh, the Natural by uh, Bernard Malbud, written in 1954, and the film was um, released in 1984, starring Robert Redford as Roy Hobbs. Field of Dreams in 1989, um, the Kevin Costner, James Earl Jones film. And uh, one, of the best mem <clears throat> one of the best memories that I have, uh, we, t uh, we took a baseball trip in 1993. My son was eight years old at the time, and he's, he's 34 now. But we did 11 cities in two weeks, including a trip to Dyersville, Iowa, to the Field of Dreams movie site. The film, was, again, was released in 1889. We were there in 1993. And I've been there uh, twice, including the, the first trip with him. And I'm not sure if the, if the, the nature of the, of the area has changed. But when we were there, and we remember we had showed the early equipment of the thick-barreled bats. So there were a couple of those bats along the batting cage and a couple of balls. We brought our baseball gloves with us on the trip. And he, and he picks up a bat and he gets in the batting cage. I get a couple of balls and I start through pitching. 
And I'm thinking, well, this is where Kevin Costner, James Earl Jones, uh, it was, uh, and, and the players that, that came out of the cornfield. And so he's eight years old and he only swings a couple of times. And then so the next kid comes in and I feel a tap on my back. And this man turns around and he goes, that's my son, could I pitch to him? So I flip him the ball and I say, that's why we're here. And to me, that's one of the, uh, that's one of the great memories that I have. Um, and I, and uh, as a little league coach, um, and he also played a little in high school as well. Um, Gary Cooper uh, <coughs> in film. Gary Cooper uh, as as the uh, as Lou Gehrig in this particular film. And this is one of the the latest baseball films where, with Chadwick Bosman played Robinson and Harrison Ford played Branch Rickey um, in. Uh, in the Jackie Robinson story, 42 that came out just a couple of years ago. Also, another really good baseball movie. Uh, I didn't include Bull Durham, but that's okay. We have our favorites. Eight Men Out, about the Black Sox scandal in 1919, where a number of players accepted bribes to throw games in the 1919 World Series against Cincinnati. Um, Al Seacott, the pitcher, uh, Acknowledge his involvement. Shoeless Joe Jackson received five thousand uh, dollars. Later recanted his story, and, and Jackson finished with the third highest batting average in the history of the game, not in the Hall of Fame because of his involvement um, in, in 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 this particular activity. So, if there's no gambling in baseball, there's certainly no crying in baseball either. <laughs> this is uh, Petty Marshall's film, uh, League of Their Own. Uh, with Tom Hanks, um, Gina Davis, um, where they depict the Rockford Peaches, and we'll talk about the Rockford Peaches in a, f in a few minutes. So if you talk about baseball, we have to talk about presidents throwing out the first pitch and their involvement in the game. So the image on the left is President Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson on the right, and as long as the games were played in Washington, presidents participated. William Howard Taft on the left uh, was regarded as the first to throw out a pitch in 1910. And there's an interesting story about Taft. I mean, um, he was an ardent sports fan. He was a great golfer. Um, well, he loved golf. I don't know if he was any good, but he really liked the game. So he's at a game one day in Washington. It's in the middle of the seventh inning. And this guy must have weighed about 350 pounds. He was really big. And he was getting tired of sitting, so he stood up to kind of stretch himself in the middle of the seventh inning. And so there were other people that stood up in respect. And so it had the seventh inning stretch. So it started with, with William Howard Taft uh, in the early 1910s. So, out, so here are some uh, interesting facts about presidents outside of the Oval Office and their engagement in the game. Um, it's, uh, Robert Reagan actually watched uh, the, the opening game of the 19. 84 World Series from the dug, or the, uh, 1984 opening day from the dugout, which was kind of interesting. Just like any other business, <clears throat> just like any other business, baseball has its labor issues. And this is Marvin Miller, who helped organize the players in the 1970s and became the first president of the Players Association, Players Union. Miller was a labor lawyer who became involved in baseball, and many feel that because of his champion of, of players, player rights, and eventually free agency, that he belongs in the Baseball Hall of Fame, and he's not there. Um, but Miller was clearly instrumental on how the game changed in the late 20th century with salaries, free agency, and player, and player rights. And this was precipitated by Kurt Flood, Kurt Flood played for the St. Louis Cardinals in the mid-60s. He was a terrific player, led the National League in singles many times. He was part of the 1964 World Championship team with Bob Gibson and, and Ken Boyer at third and Tim McCarver behind the plate. Um, but in October of 1969, Flood was traded from St. Louis to Philadelphia and said that he was not going to be, he was not going to, um, go as part of that trade. Um, and he writes a letter to the to then Commissioner uh, Bowie Kuhn saying that his rights were abrogated. Let me read you very briefly 
an excerpt of the letter that he wrote, and that really clarifies how he stood regarding the particular trade and the use of players as collateral. And he said, and, and, he, and he writes a letter to Baseball Commissioner Bowie Kuhn on December the 24th, 1969, and says, after 12 years in the major leagues, I do not feel I am a piece of property to be bought and sold irrespective of my wishes. I believe that any system that produces and result, that results in the violation of my basic rights as a citizen is inconsistent with the laws of the United States and several states. The commissioner disagreed with that, so Flood um, then sues Major League Baseball for a million dollars and winds up in the U.S. Supreme Court, who eventually rules in favor of the owners and that Flood is forced to retire from the game. Um, however, he did exactly what he wanted to do and it stopped uh, the owners from controlling player contracts and, uh, and, and involved um, greater player movement. And now we know what happens um, in the late ninth, in the late 20th century, and now into the early 21st century, of player movements, contracts, um, and there was a compromise that yes, players would be allowed to be free agents, but th but they would have to be, um, but they would have to play a certain number of years for that to happen. So when we say that that recently, that for example, that Bryce Harper signed that huge contract with the Phillies, he was able to do that, having fulfilled the previous playing obligation. And so baseball is so important to the American conscience. Um, we can see these images uh, regarding baseball and, and its labor consequences. Um, baseball did develop internationally, um, especially in Japan in the 1930s. Uh, some of the iconic figures that it came over from Japan, Otani um, um, could be the first pitcher as well as um, hit in, in the same game, uh, although he's been injured, he's with the Angels. <coughs> And Ichiro Suzuki on the right holds the major league record for most hits in one season, 252, and recently retired the, as a Seattle Mariner. The Mariners and the Oakland A's opened the 2019 season in Japan, where Ichiro came back as a, as a, as a, as a beyond an iconic figure um, in Japan. So these are some of the images uh, of, of players who've come over um, During World War II, there was the internment of the Japanese in various camps in the United States. One, there were two in Arizona. The image on the left is actually a, a, an individual who was interned in Gila, in Gila Bend in Arizona, pointing to himself as a baseball player. The image on the right shows that baseball was an important part of the camp, even though it was a, a very difficult time for Japanese Americans uh, in the 1940s, uh, that <clears throat> that they were able to pay, um, to able to uh, ex execute uh, baseball and some cultural activities, and again the image on the right shows that um, several obviously did participate in the activity. We talked about the Rockford Peaches. Um, the All the All American Girls Professional Baseball League was formed in 1943 by William Wrigley, who was the president of the Chicago Cubs at the time, and because of the war and so many um, players went off, there was a need to fill the, the reality of, uh, <clears throat> of keeping baseball uh, on the home front. Image on the left, Dottie um, Kamashek is uh, from Cincinnati, was considered the best player in the league, uh, played for the Rockford Peaches. And we can see them on the, on, the, on the right. What's interesting to note about the promotional poster on the left, this is the schedule. And this, all the towns were essentially in very close proximity to one another. Kenosha, South Bend, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Peoria, Fort Wayne, Battle Creek. That was because of the wartime travel restrictions, um, both in terms of, of um, transportation availability and also because of gasoline. So. This particular league had its, had its composition in the middle of the country. Wrigley was from Chicago, and so that's where most of the teams took place. Or, and we had talked about uh, the film The League of Their Own, uh, which was the um, a fictional account of the Rockford Peaches. The image on the upper left, Gina Davis, 
closely closely resembled Dotty Kamashek, um, although Dotty was left-handed, Gina was right-handed, but it's Hollywood, so that's okay. But the film of the, their own was inspired by the, by the Rockford Peaches and became uh, one of the best baseball films um, produced. For those who grew up in various cities, um, either radio and television, there were the voices of the games. Uh, the image on the left, Harry Callis. Um, um, I was fortunate enough to cover a couple of Phillies games. Uh, Callis was a great, great personality, bigger than life. And outside of the press box, there's, this, there's a media room where you could have lunch or dinner afterwards. Some people actually go in and work and write afterwards. But after every home game at Veterans Stadium, Callis would hold court. He would sit down, they would break out the beer, and he would stay there for hours just telling stories. And it was just a, it was just a, a, a delight to be in his company. Um, Jack Buck on the right, for those from the Midwest, uh, did the Cardinal games. One of the great uh, memories that I have of the game, um, I was working for a small paper outside of Philadelphia. Um, and in two, 1999, um, I happened to be in the Midwest researching for a book I was writing. And I went to old Tiger Stadium. It was the last year before Tiger Stadium closed down and Comerica came. So, and and the, the media room was really, really tiny. There were circular tables. They were all empty except one table. There were 10 people around listening to Ernie Harwell, the great Tigers broadcaster. Um, and he was, he was, in, that was a great memory that I still have. Red Barber, the image on the left, and Vince Scully, the image on the right. I have, um, um, I, have uh, I happen to cover, I was, again, I was fortunate to cover some games in Dodger Stadium, and Vince Scully on the right retired just a couple of years ago, and in the very last game um, that, that um, I was there, as soon as the game was over, the pre there was a, there's an elevator right across the hall that take you right down to the clubhouse, but the elevator has stopped them. And you have to wait for Vince Scully and his entourage to come onto the elevator. And so I had a copy of the Dodgers media guide. And I said, and you're not supposed to do this. And it's, it's made very clear uh, on the back of your credential, no autographs. But, but I said, Vin, you got to sign this. And I gave him a pen. And he said, well, wait a minute. This is blue ink, and this is a blue margin. I, I, I have it here. I should, I'll bring it out. He goes, well, that's okay, just write, like, inside so you can see it. And he goes, um, and I have my media credential on my name, and he goes, no problem, Mark, anytime. So he was able to personalize, uh, so, I, so on the cover, and it's, it's hanging up on, next to my computer. But what a, um, and he always had that great phrase, remember? He would come on the air, and he goes, and it's time for Dodger baseball. And that's still for, uh, that still resonates uh, throughout Dodger Stadium. Harry Carey on the right for Cub fans. He would always have his microphone dialing out in the seventh inning stretch. Let me hear you now, a one, a two. And Wrigley Field would explode and take me out to the ball game. And Mel Allen, the great Yankee broadcaster, how about that? And that was, that was his favorite expression. Um, but as I said, I've been really fortunate to, to able to, to cover games, and this is how we do it. First, you arrive at the ballpark. This is, these are images of Petco Park in San Diego. It could be any stadium in America. But I was fortunate enough, we were there last week uh, when the Diamondbacks played three games in San Diego and was able to cover those games. And so these, these are images from the field. So you first arrive at the ballpark, um, and now this is the outside of the, of the, so we'll take you through Chase Field. For right now so this is the outside of the clubhouse you can see the image on the right it has here the clubhouse is only is open a, about an hour prior to the game so you're able to go in and talk to players um, and then it's closed um, and this is how the locker room is set up they're individual cubicles with chairs very neat and or orderly um, uh, the manager meets with the media prior to each game. So you go through the store and it leads into the interview room where they'll sit in a little little desk like that. And then we sit, here's uh, Tori Lavella, the current Diamondbacks manager, would sit here and then there are their chairs here, very similar to like a, a very small classroom. And then we'll ask questions and uh, I usually 
tape them so the, so the, the quotes are accurate. Um, so those on television, uh, there are cameras that are strategically placed throughout the stadium. This is off of the first base side. Uh, there's one on the third base side, one behind the plate and be behind the center field fence, so you can see the pitches that come in. Um, and, and Fox Sports has, has the local contract. This is inside the clubhouse. You can see that on the image on the right, modern amenities, there are TV sets for the players here, over here. And you can see the locker um, and the sofas with, usually there's literature on the table regarding baseball. There's TV here, and then the lockers are here. So that's my seat. The image on the left is my seat. Uh, I'm just off of um, home plate, um, just uh, along the first base side. There's my name, and there's my laptop, and that's my view of the stadium from where I sit. I've been fortunate enough to be in a couple of winning locker rooms. This is the one. This is the one when the um, Arizona Diamondbacks beat the Colorado Rockies in the 2017 wild card game. You can see their beverage of choice uh, getting chilled over there. And the image on the right is 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 chaotic in any winning locker room. And it you really have to protect, especially if you're in there with a camera, you really have to protect yourself because the champagne just goes all over. And you want to stay away because if it gets in your eyes, you can see that some of the most of the players have goggles on to protect themselves, but it gets it gets really crazy uh, in a winning locker room like that. So a couple of interesting facts about the game. Um, the, we talked about the development of the game um, at the major league level, but there's high school, there's college, there's little league, there, there are um, town teams. The image on the left, FH, Fred Harvey, um, the entre entrepreneur that helped to, that, that helped to um, um, house and, and uh, address tourist information in the West in the early 20th century. This is, um, so he had, um, especially in the Grand Canyon, he had a number of, uh, along with Mary Coulter, his architect, um, had uh, a number of hotels that were built. And so among the workers, they formed their own baseball team, Fred Harvey. So this was a, a, an example of a, of a company team, and the, and the image on the right, um, the school that, took, uh, that, that housed students inside the Grand Canyon actually had their own baseball team. So this is uh, in a, a team picture from 1953. Um, we talked about Wrigley Field and um, Fenway Park as being two of the oldest um, ballparks in America, and that's true. This is actually the oldest one, and this is in Bisbee called Warren Park. It was built in 1909. And it's still in operation. Uh, the team on the left is from Tombstone, not too far from Bisbee, who actually um, have played um, uh, a number of games. This is the early 20th century for Tombstone. But Warren Park um, is on the <coughs> excuse me is on the National Register of Historic Places, and it's considered the oldest uh, the oldest ballpark still in operation in America. Notice the year was 1909. Arizona did not enter the Union until 1912. So this was territorial Arizona, um, and it's still in operation. Anyone know Jackie Mitchell? Um, Jackie Mitchell um, is, a, is a great story. Uh, Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig, the image on the left, um, along with many of their teammates, would barnstorm through the country and through um, international venues Jackie Mitchell was a left-handed pitcher and struck out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig back to back, and as a result was banned from playing against boys ever again. <laughs> uh, Jackie Mitchell actually, and, and there was a, um, a small blurb about her in a recent edition of the Smithsonian, for those who get the magazine. Jackie Mitchell is a great story. Uh, Richie Ashburn from the Philadelphia Phillies hit the same woman twice with a foul ball. <laughs> Struck her first when she was in the stands, and struck her again when she was leaving for medical. <laughs> and so that's what that's one of the great stories of the game. And so fun facts: um, life of a baseball's maybe five pitches, it might be even less now. Um, more than fifty balls are hit in the stands during the course of a game. 
um, and baseballs uh, used at the major league level are stamped with the autograph of the baseball commissioner. So hot dogs are the most popular fan favorite. Um, 21 million in 2014. Anybody thirsty when you go to the game? <laughs> and uh, Americans consumed over 600 pounds of peanuts a year, not all at the ballpark. But I usually take, uh, I, I usually take a little bag of peanuts with me. I've done it for years. I, I can't get away from taking peanuts to the ball game with me. So what about the future of the game? This is the new stadium in Atlanta. There's talk about having a new stadium in uh, Phoenix. One will open next year in, in the Dallas for the Texas Rangers. But what's different about these new stadiums is that they, they're not standalone structures. They're part of a mixed use development for retail, for um, office space, for hotel space. This is in Atlanta and you can see that around the stadium all of these amenities have all been built. So it becomes a community very, very similar to Wrigleyville, but um, in a much more concise, um, the New England Patriots and their stadium in Foxborough have a similar village like that. Um, this was developed in Atlanta, and, if, and there's discussion now about uh, the Arizona Diamondbacks leaving Chase Field. Um, I don't think that's gonna happen. And so, um, the nature of the game is changing too with the, with the advent uh, of analytics. And again, uh, w when you listen to the players and you listen to the managers, they will talk about the importance of analytics, um, trends, developments, strategies, more so than um, employing the particular game, game plan based on observation. It's more based on technology and calculation. One of the things that's developed about baseball is that phrases indigenous to the game have find its way into the American lexicon of language. Um, if you cancel with somebody, they'll take a rain check. Same thing going to the ball game. Or if someone is kind of kind of uh, strange or bizarre out there, he's, he's out there in left field. Right? Another expression that's been taken. Um, or if you're in the middle of the negotiations, well, okay, uh, I guess we're in the ballpark. So some of the expressions that are indigenous to the game are now part of the American language. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes in the, in the game, um, and I think it, it speaks volume to the, to the nature of baseball in America. Um, Casablanca is one of my favorite movies, but from Bogart, this is one of my favorite lines. But as we talked about before, what's really great about the game is that there are, um, there's always an open-ended question. Uh, segments, personalities are always open to discussion for conversation. So what do you think? Pete Rose, Roger Clemens, Shulis Joe Jackson, all out of the Baseball Hall of Fame for various uh, violations. Should they be in? Should they be out? Rose is the all-time leader in hits. Clemens had a great career with the Red Sox and the Yankees. We talked about Shulis Joe Jackson and his involvement with the White Sox scandal in 1919. So this is a debate that continues. Um, we're in, um, the the uh, media members that uh, we talk about all the day, we all the time. We talk about whether these particular individuals. Um, still have value to the game, whether they belong in the Baseball Hall of Fame, or whether they are reserved for a footnote to the game. So these are decisions um, and observations and insight that people continue to have about the history and the future of the game. Um, to go back, this, is a, this image captures a, the essence of baseball, the romanticism um, and, and the interest uh, that, that people have in the game. Um, I'm sure we all have comments, observations, insights. Uh, we all play the game. We all know people who played it. Our, our kids play the game.